I'm very excited to introduce tonight's presenters. Alicia Weisel is a recovering Wall Street executive. Since retiring from a 25-year financial market, excuse me, from a 25-year financial markets career at Goldman Sachs at the end of 2019, he served in 2020 as one of the lead technologists in Mike Bloomberg's presidential campaign. In his most recent board position at the Good Shepherd Services, Alicia raised millions of dollars for New York's neediest by convening Midnight Madness, where hundreds of finance professionals stayed up all night solving elaborate puzzles on the city streets. He's the only child of Holocaust survivor, author, professor, and Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Eli Weisel. Rabbi Joy Levitt is the CEO of the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Prior to coming to the JCC, Rabbi Levitt served as a congregational rabbi on Long Island and in New Jersey for 20 years. She earned a bachelor's degree from Barnard College, followed by a master's degree from New York University and a rabbinical degree from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Rabbi Levitt founded the Jewish Journeys Project, an initiative designed to revolutionize Jewish education for children. As a lay leader, she serves on the boards of Abu Dhabi, the Jewish Corps for Service, and the Shefa School, a new Jewish community day school for children with language-based learning disabilities. Joy is married to Michael Strassfeld, also a rabbi, with whom she co-authored A Night of Questions, a Passover Haggadah. Together, they have five children. Alicia and Rabbi Levitt, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and first, let me just say what an honor it is to be studying with Alicia Wiesel. It's the other way uh, around. I'm, 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 uh, mar I'm married up in my home life, and I've married up with this Chavrusa. Uh, <laughs> so I want to assure our listeners that um, I am actually not doing Dafyomi, but Alicia is. And when he invited me to, to join him here, he said, don't worry, I'm swimming in this mas Masechet. So I can take the lead here. And I said, don't worry, I'm swimming in COVID regulations and trying to reopen the JCC. So all good. But we're going to have a lot more to say about that. Um, first, Alicia, before we get started, just a word about Dafyomi and, and where we are in the Talmud right now and, and how you got into this. Because I hear you haven't been doing this your whole life. Yeah. Well, look, it's funny. I think I got into it kind of the way you got into it, which is a, uh, you know, I'm a friend who pulled you in and I too had a friend who pulled me in. It was actually the day this cycle. So a word on Daf Yomi. Daf Yomi is about a seven um, and, and fraction year cycle that goes through the entire Talmud, the entire Babylonian Talmud. So there's parts of the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud that we don't, but still it's a big adventure. You go through every page, it's thousands of pages, and every day you do one page. And it could be Yom Kippur, in which case you're doing it after you're fasting and you're exhausted. It could be in the middle of a weekday where you're fitting it in amidst God knows what. Um, it's something you make time for and it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, the Talmud, I, I think most people have familiarity with it. It's a you know thousands of years old conversation across generations with text written in the center that dates back from uh, really just after Roman times, um, you know, Mishnahs that are being commentated on by by the Amoraim and the Tanaim, and then you have on top of them Rashi and Tosfot. So it's the way to think about it is a conversation uh, that, that's lasted thousands of years. And, uh, and where we are at the moment is we're in the middle of Masachet Yoma, uh, and, and Masachet is section, and Yoma means the day. And the day that we're talking about is the big one. We're talking about Yom Kippur. So we are in the middle of the action of Yom Kippur. We're learning all about the Yom Kippur service. We're finding about the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and what his day was like that day of Yom Kippur. And the week before it, lots of crazy things are happening in the week before it. For example, because he has to atone, and the Torah says he has to atone live to for his household, he has to be married. So what happens if his wife dies? Guess what? He gets a backup wife. That's thought about in this Gemara. Um, the arrangement. That's a of the great backup. advertisement for the study of Talmud, right? <laughs> the backup <laughs> wife. Um, you know, they they lecture him for a week. They make sure that he's studying and learning all these things. And then you're like, why? Why do they have to lecture him? He's the Kohen Gadol. Doesn't he know this stuff? And then you start getting a little bit of a history lesson as well. And you learn that in the times of the Second Temple, the Kohen Gadol was a spot that you would procure through corruption. It would go to the highest bidder. So the high priest was simply the family that put down the most. Why has money. nothing changed? And, and, and they're all terrified that he's going to die because apparently Kohen Gadol, after Kohen Gadol, they'd go into the Holy of Holies, there to atone for the entire nation, and they'd get burnt to a crisp. 
So I kid you not, it's written in the Gemara that they used to have iron chains around him so that when he got smoked, they could pull out the smoking corpse, you know, and uh, and dispose of him. Um, which was That wasn't fun. an advertisement for Dafyomi. I don't know what is. <laughs> but I will say, and now, and I know you're going to share the screen, um, that um, one of the things that's so appealing about this idea of Dafyomi is that we can all manage it, however complicated our lives are. It's just a page. And there are literally hundreds of different ways you can study Dafyomi. Sometimes you can do it by yourself. You can do it with a, a chevruta as we're doing tonight. You can do it as a podcast. You can go to a class. Um, here we're going to look at how the actual page of a Talmud looks with the Mishnah and the Gemara and the commentaries uh, around it. And uh, and now um, let's start with the mission. Yeah, and actually maybe maybe one thing that we can do first, and hopefully my sound will work, is I'm just going to give you guys a sense of how dangerous this was for the Kohen Gadol and how stakes the, the how high the stakes are. Um, for those of you who do choose to attend Shul on Yom Kippur, um, you'll notice at one point the service gets broken up with a slightly happy song. So I'm going to try to play it for you if I can. Let's see if this works. Um, Come on, technology, let's go. Here we are. Joy, give me a thumbs up when we hear music. Okay. Not yet. No sound, right? No sound. Okay. Well, there's this little song that goes, yeah, da 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 da. And that song is called Marek Kohen, which is the happiness that the that the Kohen has made it out successfully. Okay, so we're gonna start here. Um, and we're starting with Masnissin, so we, we learn in the Mishnah. I, I do think, Alicia, it's hysterical that Jordana is telling you, you telling the technologists, the great technologists, that if you unplug your earphones, we can hear the sound. Oh, uh, that's okay. The sound's not that important. I, okay. I gave you a little clip of singing, <laughs> but thank you, Jordana. Um, okay, so Masnissin, Heviohu Leves Haparva. So that means they brought then the Kohen Gadol to the, the chamber of Parva, and we'll find out a little bit more about what that means. Uva Kodesh Hayita. And that was actually in the holy courtyard. So let's just take a quick look at a diagram here. And uh, everyone can see that this was like the outer courtyard. And then you could come into the main temple area. This was considered the Kodesh. This was like the holy area. And actually, the Kohen Gadol is going to this one little spot. You guys can see my cursor, right? Yes. My cursor moves. So this little spot with the water, that's where there's a mikvah. That's where he would go to, to wash himself. And that's called the, the chamber of Parva. And we'll find out a little bit more about that. Um, parsu sadin shall boots, they would spread a sheet of white linen or flax, beno levenaam, between him and between the people. Kidesh yadavera glav, he sanctified his hands and feet, ufashat, and he, uh, and he got undressed. Rabbi Meir Omer, fashat kidesh yadavera glav. So there's already a little disagreement. Rabbi Meir says, no, 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 first he got undressed from his previous garments. And just so we know what his previous garments were, I'm just going to um, try to share a slightly different photo here. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to keep going. But imagine these golden garments. That's what he was wearing for the for the earlier service, and now he's switching in, into white. Um, okay, so I think we should just, those of you, who, excuse me, but those of you who um, attend Yom Kippur services um, in the afternoon know some of this from the Avodah service. Um, it's very, very, as as Elisha said, it's it's heavy, it's frightening, there's a lot of weight here. And here we are talking about his clothes. I just want to, you know, <laughs> park that because this is like serious stuff. And actually, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what he's wearing. And and how much it costs. And, and his mom. And it's, and it's his mom, all sorts right. of interesting stuff here. So, um, okay, so he he's just finished. He undressed. He washed his hands and feet. Yarad v'taval, he goes into the mikvah. Um Allah the Nistafag, he gets out and he dries off. He viulo big day lavan, they bring him the white clothing. Lavash, he wears it. The kidesh yadavaraglav, and he sanctifies his hands and feet again. Beshachar in the morning, Hayalovesh Plusin. So he was wearing a certain Egyptian outfit. It was made out of Egyptian linen. Shalshne Masarmana, and it cost twelve Asarmana. Now let's just do a little calibration here on money, because it, it's sort of helpful. One mana. Um, is 50 shekel, or it's 100 zoos. There's a couple ways to think about it. For those of you who remember the Chad Gadia song, two zoos gets you a goat. So one way to think about this is that this is a 50 goat um, outfit that he's wearing, you know, enough to feed a family for, you know, maybe a month or two. 
Ben Harbayim, in the evening, he wears Hinduian, something from Hindu, from India. He wears these Indian uh, linens. So this is a costume change. So everybody, you, you know, like the Oscars, right? In the morning, he's wearing one outfit and the afternoon another. So, so here he's wearing, this is like two thirds of the previous cost. So this is, you know, uh, a little less. It's like 33 goods. Um, Divrei Rabbi Meir. So that's what Rabbi Meir says. So the sages say, actually, it was, he had an 18 mana, uh, which is, you know, getting closer to, uh, so, so, you know, 18 times 50, it's like a 900 uh, uh, situation. So that's a lot. That's like, that's like hundreds of goats now. So like these are getting to be pretty expensive, um, you know, outfits. Another way to think about it is one shekel is like 10 gram of silver. So like, you know, a shekel is about $10. So, you know, one mana is like, uh, one mana is 50 shekels. So that's five, that's $500. Um, Okay, so now, okay, and hakol shloshim mana, so the whole thing adds up to 30. Elu Michel Tzibor. And all of this is paid out of the public treasury. Woohoo! Ah, the Imrat Saleh Hosif, Mosif Michelot. And if he wants to get an even nicer outfit, he can do that, but he's got he's to pay out of his own pocket. Okay, so that's the Mishnah. That was written, you know, just slightly after, uh, really at, at Roman times, after the destruction of the Second Temple is when many of these sayings were put together, and then they were compiled a century or two later. So that's the Mishnah. It comes from, you know, somewhere in the first century. Now we turn the page, and we are into 35a, which is today's daf. And we're now into Gemara. That Gimel Mem over here means now we're starting to comment on it. So the first question is, my parva. What's this chamber of parva? Ama Rav Yosef. Parva amigosha. And I love this word. Joy and I were sort of discovering it together when we prepped a little bit. Um, he says, parva was an amigosha. What's an amigosha? Well, if you go to the root, mem gimel shun, magosh, it's a magus, a magician. This is, you know, was a Zoroastrian Persian magician um, who was, uh, who, who this is named after. So it's kind of strange. Why do we name this chamber after a Persian magician? We go down to our, our friend uh, here in Tosfos and we see Parva Amagosha. And it basically says, Ki chafar mechila tachatakarka bakadosh. This is a sorcerer who dug a tunnel under the temple. Ad shiira avodat kohen gadol because he wanted to sneak a peek at what the high priest was doing. So they caught him and they named the spot where they, uh, where they found him digging as, uh, as, the, as the Parva tunnel. Alicia, why do we know, what, what do you think the significance of this is? Why, why is this important or it's just incidental? It's incidental, but so much of the Talmud is incidental. I mean, I think that in particular, the Talmud liked to pick fights with these Persian sorcerers. Um, you know, I'm gonna flip for a moment to, uh, to a different Masachet in Sanhedrin. And uh, you see this little story here, you know, they're, they're picking a fight. So a certain Magus in Amagosha said to a Maymar, he said, you know, from your midpoint and up, this is the domain of Hormiz, the god of good, but from below, it's the domain of a Hormiz. So the Rav says to him, really? So does the top guy let the bottom guy like urinate in his territory? They're picking fights with these Amagosha. It's like a little, um, I don't know how to, how to describe, a little theological ribbing going on across, across belief systems. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the next part, Parsusadin Shalbutz. My Shnashal Boots, what's so special about linen? Amar of Kahana. Kadesh Yakir Avodat Hayom, but big day boats. So that the, that the high priest is going to remember he's got to put on the white linen. You spread a white linen sheet, so he remembers the white linen clothes. Now, again, remember, what's the reason that they're so worried the Kohen Gadol is going to do the wrong thing? Because they're worried he's a neophyte. He, like, you know, he was like running the, uh, you know, some business. Some, so he was a merchant. And, you know, maybe like a minute later, he's being popped into the high priesthood and he's so likely to screw it up. So they're just reminding him any chance they can. Um, uh, and the, the Gemara is asking a question. Do we really need uh, the Gemara to tell us that it added up to 30? Hey, you know, we can add 18 and 12 here. We're not uneducated here. Um, so what's going on here? The Gemara is telling us that, it's, uh, that really the only thing that matters is that it adds up to that total. You can take from one and good to the others between the morning clothing and the evening clothing, but they got to add up to 30. I almost that imagine that, you know, he puts one on in the morning and it's not worth enough. So then he takes out a more expensive one in the <laughs> afternoon just so that, you know, and I am very much struck by this um, as though he needs to be reminded of the significance of what he's doing. Right. I think yeah. your point is really well taken that, that 
the high priest is not, he's not walking around laden with the burden of being a high priest until this moment. And he's got to actually put on a costume in order to play the part in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to learn about what happens also when he takes off the costume, which, which, right. is, which is something we can chat about as well. Um, no matter what, they all agree. They all agree that the morning clothing for the morning service is nicer, that, that it, has to, it has to be more expensive. Um, Mani Lee, so how do you how do you know this? Amar Rav Huna, Berev de Rav Eli Amar, Kara, and how do you know? And they said because there's a certain verse that says four times about the, the morning clothes. It says bad, 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 bad. It says it four times. I'm just going to show you the verse where it says that. It's in Vayikra. So here's the uh, the verse where we're talking about it. It says, Ketonet bad kodesh yil bas. Remichnesei bad yihiu al besaro. Uveavnet bad yakat. So over and over, it's it's emphasizing linen so we're getting a very clear message that the linen is kind of where it's at um, and that it's a big deal it's got to be the best linen um, for that morning service um and that's how we know that the uh that it has to be the the best linen for that session mate but now they challenge really is it definitely the case that the morning ones have you want to, to go back to the gemara yeah can you guys not see the gemara no we're only we're seeing leviticus huh okay well that's weird jordana help <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch here. You're not seeing the right page? No, we're just seeing Leviticus. Boo, because I can see the right one. I'm going to stop the share and go back in. Okay. I have to look at my mug for a moment. Okay. How are we doing? Are we back in the Gemara? Uh, now I don't see anything. Black page. Hmm. Okay, let's see. Let's try sharing my whole screen, see if that does the trick. <laughs> Chabad's not having this problem right now at their session. <laughs> okay, let's see. How do I do the whole thing? And if let's... you don't, I think you could just read the Gemara and it's okay. Okay, we're going to give it one more shot here. How'd that go? No. I don't know why. We were, we were good before. Okay. Uh... Okay, well, that is a problem. How about now? Now, uh, one expert here says share the window, not the tab. Does that mean anything? That's from Jeff. Yeah, I am sharing the window. I'm actually now sharing my entire desktop. Okay. Don't know. Hmm. But okay. why don't you just keep reading? Yeah, we'll yeah. keep going. Okay. Yeah. So, so now they read from a verse that basically says uh, that, you know, after the afternoon service, you're not allowed, you know, um, so you're not supposed to go amongst the people in those clothes. Uh, so now they're saying, oh, maybe the afternoon clothes are more important because here's a verse telling you explicitly you can't mingle, you know, with the, uh, with the rest of the community in those clothes. Um, my so that's... Yeah, I mean, I'm really super interested in this this piece, right? Because um, this this question of what you wear when you're doing the thing, as opposed to what you wear when you're mingling with the people, right? And I'm wondering what you think that's about. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you were you were telling me that at one point in uh, in your experience, you remember that there was this very distinct feel when you were growing up about the robes and yeah. when did the robes come out, right? You know, like. Um, rabbis started wearing robes actually in in synagogues um right after um german um unification when when the rise of reformed judaism was really um in play because that's what christian clergy were doing so suddenly jewish clergy needed to look like christian clergy so as though to prove that we could be citizens just like everybody else and that's where you see this like rabbis dressing the part, right? Not looking like congregants, as it were. Um, and I grew up in a conservative synagogue where the, where the rabbi definitely wore a robe, but took it off at the Onik and I, or at Kiddush. And I always like was very struck by the fact that during services, he didn't look like a person. He looked like a rabbi. And during Kiddush with a cup of schnapps in his hand and an egg kichel, he looked like like everybody else. And there must have been some point there that 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 they're getting at here too, which is that um, 
there is a burden to holding the guilt of the Israelite people um, on his shoulders, literally, so that he has to be costumed. But when it's done, he's back into the into Amcha, as it were. But I love this modern history that the robes being worn by rabbinical clergy was a response to what the Christian clergy were doing. Like, yeah. hey, we're the same. Look what we're doing. And yeah, you know, friend, I mean, that was, was a big right. It was also, you know, the time that, that um, rabbis started giving sermons and not just divrei Torah, and they started speaking in the vernacular, which is to say German as opposed to Yiddish or Hebrew, really Yiddish, um, where they started going to hospitals you know, as though this was not a responsibility of every Jew, but suddenly the responsibility of clergy, all of that was borrowed from Lutheranism. I love that. I love these connections to sort of the European history. A friend was telling me recently that actually Schubert wrote the tune for Tovla Hodot, and that when the whole Torah service was being written in close conjunction with some of these great Western composers, you know, in the 1800s, you know, uh, there was all this, all this connection. Wow. Um, so let's let's keep going though because there's a lot there's a great yep. piece of agada I know we want to yes. get to so um lo uh, so 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 my love you say my love acherim no acherim chashuvin mehen we're not saying that lo acherim pechutim mehen we're saying actually the later ones are less valuable tane ruhuna bar yehuda va'amra le rav shmuel bar yehuda so so they're all saying no 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 it's it's the fact that it's these later things and you can't mix don't don't read anything into that trust us like the later garments are just not worth as much. Um, so now we get a, a little bit of, a, of an insight into how, something else, some other aspect of the clothing. Uh, so we hear from Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda. Um, after he's done with that morning service, the public service, Kohen Shastalo Imo Ketonet, a Kohen, and his mother made him the tunic, she made him the clothing, Lovsha, uh, he can wear it. The Oved Ba Avodat Yachid, and he can do the service where he's removing the ashes. That's like the service at the end. You know, he can go out. He's and cleaning go. up. He can he's wear his mother's up. thing when he's cleaning up. Isn't that cute? <laughs> he can wear it, and she's like sitting there kvelling. She's so proud. Like I made that. Uvil Vaj she misrena litzibor, but only if he went before he does it. He has to say this piece of clothing now belongs to the public treasury. Like it's not mine anymore. So it becomes a you know a, a garment that belongs to to the to the kohanim. Pshita, the Gemara says, isn't that obvious? Mahodetema, like what are we learning here? Nuchushema lo yimisrena yafe yafe. Well, you know, fine. So so were you the reason it's here? Why even include this? Is that if you were worried? You know, isn't it obvious that he can wear something his mother made him as long as he puts it into the public treasury? And the Gemara is saying, yeah, well, you know, you might have been worried that maybe it's not wholeheartedly. He's so reluctant to give it up that it's not a full-hearted gift. And they're saying, don't worry about it. Come, Ashmalan, that's why, that's why it's here. So now we're going to get into a couple of stories about the Kohens and how they dressed. Amru Alav al Rabbi Shmal bin Pabi, it says about this certain uh, Kohen, Sha'astalo imo ketonet, his mom made him a ketonet, shall mea mana. So now this is a very expensive, this is like a $6,000, you know, or more garment. Viluvsha, um, and he wore it. Uh, this is the X-rated part of this. Uh, not of quite, our, not our quite. Job. We're almost there. We're getting there. Umasara <laughs> litzibor, <laughs> <laughs> he puts it into the, the public treasury. Amru alav al Rabbi Lazar bin, and everything was fine. It, it happened. So they say, the Gemara reports, this actually happened. We have, we have evidence. It happened to this one guy. Now they tell a different story. Now we get to the X-rated. Amru Allah al Rabbi Lazar bin Kharsum. There's a certain Rav Lazar. Shastalo imo ketonech. His mom made him a tunic. Mishte ribo. That just for that is that is like a big number. That's twenty thousand mana. Like that is a huge. That's like we're we're almost into like the million dollar garment here. Velohenichu, um, but they didn't. Lohenu echava koanim veluvsha. His fellow brother Cohen's wouldn't let him wear it. Mipnesha nirek ka'arum because he looked naked. Did he really look naked? Asks the Gemara. Amar Mar Chutan Kapul Shisha. We know from Rav Yehuda Hanasi, the great prince who who put together all of the Mishnas for us, um, that it's a sixfold weave. Is it really possible that you can't see that you can't see that you can see you know body parts through it? Amar Abaye, and then the great sage Abaye says, Kechemra b'mizga. It was like uh, you could see how much wine there was in in the cup. Um, a little interesting story here about Abaye, if we can. Um, it's interesting that Abaye is sitting there, you know, comparing this to wine. Why is he sitting there comparing it to wine? It seems a little odd. Um, and he's comparing it to wine. We know from his, not his divorce proceedings, but the settlement of his estate, his good friend Rava had to settle his estate when he died. 
And the widow comes to him, comes to Rava and says, listen, I need to be taken care of in the style I'm accustomed to when my husband was alive. And, uh, and they give her food. They're like, okay, you've got it. We're paying your table for whatever it is, as long as you're living. And she says, yeah, but I also want some wine every night. Like, please, you know, I'm accustomed to it. And Rava says, no, I know he was so poor, you never had any wine. Um, so here's this man who potentially never had wine, um, uh, to, you know, dreaming about wine in this context. By the way, that story gets a little bit crazier. Uh, the, the, the widow then spreads her arms to show how much wine his, uh, her husband would give to the table. And as she does it, her arm becomes unbared. And it says in the Gemara that the light filled the synagogue from her beauty, just from the beauty of her bare arm. It gets a little weird after this. Alicia, uh, do you think it's believable that she would spend a million dollars creating the mother. a tunic, the mother, yeah. um, that was actually inappropriate? Or is, it, or is there something else going on here, you think? I don't know. Maybe it was just like velvety. Or, you know, maybe maybe it was velvety and it's so you could like see body parts through it somehow, the shape of them. And, and you know, they're here they're all checking each other. I don't know why they're doing that. Um, maybe it was like the emperor's new clothes. She claimed to have built this thing, but maybe he was just totally naked. Who knows? It's a... Uh... But lucky for us, it, it now allows us to go into a tangent um, because of this particular high priest whose mother had so much money. So Yes. So we're going to come off of the tangent of what happens next with a widow who bears her arm, because that's even racier. And we're going to go down a different tangent that the Gemara is taking us through here. Um, okay, so Tanurabana. So now we learn. Ani the Ashir Varasha, a poor man, a rich man, and a bad man, a wicked man. Ba'in Ladin. They come for judgment. And there's, a, there's other Gemaras here, so, so they're about to be asked a question. Um, omrim lo, they ask of each of them a question. Uh, le'ani omrim lo, they say to the poor person, mipne ma lo asakta betorah, why didn't you learn Torah during your lifetime? Now, interestingly enough, we learn elsewhere in the Gemara, in a different Masachet, that there's a series of questions you get asked when you die. Um, any guesses what the first question is, or Joy, you probably know. Uh, well, um, about weights and measures. Right? It is absolutely the very first question is: Were you were you honest in your business dealings? So if you survive that, the next question is: You know, did you make time for Torah study? So le'ani omrim lo mipnei malo asakta b'Torah. Why didn't you uh, Why didn't you study Torah? Im uh, omer ani hayiti v'tarud b'biznotai. He says, I couldn't. I was so busy just trying to get sustenance to live. Omrim lo, they tell him. Klum ani haita yoter mi Hillel? Were you, uh, were you, you know, were you even more poor than than Hillel? Amru alav al Hillel zaken, because it was said about Hillel hazaken. Shebechol yom vayom haya ose umistaker. Every day he went out and he would try to earn a living. Uh, Bitar payik. He got paid like you know, it's like nothing. He paid a nickel, barely anything. You know, half, half a dinar, not not that much. Chetzio hayanotein l'shomer beit hamidrash. Half he would give to the guard at the house of study so that he could participate. The chetzio leparnasato leparnasat anshe beitam, and half he yes. would give so that his family could live. Yeah, a word about this, which seems, um, I think, disturbing on some level. Um, why was there a guard standing outside preventing you from studying? And there was actually a sense that. Um, that the Torah scholars ought to come from the elite classes, um, primarily, I think, because it made them um, not susceptible to the pressure from the wealthy class. That is, if the Torah scholars were poor, they could be leaned on by their um, patrons, as it were. Um, just a fun fact that when Hillel becomes um, head of his own academy, he bans this practice. And in fact, he 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 does not allow for um, for this um, guard that that is required, um, you know, to be like tipped, as it were, or paid off in order to get um, to the study. And it it still it still happened episodic episodically until until Gamliel really just puts a puts a, a stop to it. 
but there is a kind of elitism to to Jewish study in those days. Right? Actually, it's, it's Gamliel unfortunately continues the the practice. It goes back and forth for like these rabbinic generations. Huh, Rabban, I thought Gamliel finished Eli, it off. But Eli, he no, right. El, it's it's Elazar ben Azaria takes over from Rabban Gamliel. Um, Rabban Gamliel messes up in one way or another, and uh, Elazar ben Azaria is approached to come in and take over. And for those of you who uh, read the Haggadah every year at Pesach, there's a phrase about Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria is talking to his wife. They make his God makes his beard turn white early, and he's like, "I don't know, should I do this?" They throw you know Jewish community leadership when they're done with us, they throw us out. Do I really <laughs> want to go through with that? <laughs> and uh, and I look so young, and so God turns his beard white, and you know he talks to his wife, and he's convinced that he should do it. But when Ele- when Elazar ben Azaria takes it over, he gets rid of the guard, he opens up the doors, everybody can come in, and then uh, interestingly enough, Rabban Gamliel realizes what a mistake he'd made in keeping so many people away from Torah learning. And he, uh, has sent, and he has sent a dream that there are 400 urns filled with white ash, from which he learns that, ah, they weren't worth it anyway. They're not really learning. But then the Gemara says, but it was a, it was, it was a false dream sent by God just so that he wouldn't feel bad. Interesting, like, little story. That tangent. We, again, so back tan- to Hillel. Back to Hillel. Okay, so, so where were we? So, da 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 um, so every day he went out, he earned this uh, trapaik. He gave half to the guard, half, half to his family. Um, there was one time he didn't find enough to live on for the day, not enough to keep him fed. So the, the, the guard of the Beit Midrash wouldn't let him in, like he canes, wouldn't let him in. He went up and he sat. He climbed the roof and he sat on the skylight. So that he could listen to the words of the living God. Now these guys are big guys that we're talking about. Shmaya and Avtalion. If you ever read Pirkei Avos, they're in like they're in the Pasuk 10 and 11. You start learning about Shmaya and Avtalion. They're they're one of the couples that get before the uh, the real authors of the Mishnah. So they're they're a very big deal. And in fact, there's a tangent that tells about how all the people wanted to follow them instead of the Kohen Gadol. Amru Oto, Hayom of Tayon Amru Oto, Hayom Erev Shabbos. And this was, uh, it was Erev Shabbos. Hayav Tukufat Tevet, and it was winter, so it was cold. Hayta, Vayered Hayta, Vayered Alav Sheleg Mina Shamayim, and snow was coming down from the sky. Kisha Allah. Amur Hashachar, and when morning came, Amar lo Shmaya le Avtalion. Shmaya says to Avtalion, Avtalion achi, Avtalion my brother. B'chol yom habayt meir, habayt meir. Every day our home is lit. V'hayom, the, the base midrash is lit. V'hayom afel, but today it's gray. Uh, Shma yom hameunanhu, maybe there's something different. Maybe it's a cloudy day. Hetzitzu e'nehen v'ra'u d'mut adam ba'aruba. They lifted their eyes and they saw there was a figure of a man stuck in the skylight. Alu umatsu alav. Rum shalosh amot shelik, and here is this guy buried under three amot or yards of snow. Prakuhu vechatziruhu veharchitzuhu vesichuhu vehoshivuhu keneged hamedura. So they get him, they 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 rub him down with oil, they they you know give him some water to open up his pores, and they put him opposite the fire. Amrura raui zeli chlal alav et shabbat, and they say this one for what he did, just to be able to hear a little Torah, we can break Shabbat for him. So that's the first of three stories. This is the story about the poor person. Although there is this very interesting thing about this, right? Because I think we mostly think like to save a life, you can you can um, violate Shabbat, right? So what, what do you think is going on here? Well, the commentary says that it's a bit more of an open discussion. Are you always obligated to save a life if the person intentionally puts themselves in danger? If the person is unintentionally in danger or it's through no fault of their own, then you have to go out of your way. But there's a bit of a discussion. If somebody like really is just insisting on getting into trouble, walking into traffic again and again, do you have to break Shabbos for it? But I think they're, they're making a point here that no matter what, this guy, he intentionally did it and we have to save him. Um, they, were, they were very impressed with his actions. Okay, next story. Now we're going to come back to Harmsam. Yeah, so now we come back to uh, now we come back to Hashem. Ashir Omrim Lo Mipnei Malo Asakta BeTorah. The rich guy, hey, rich guy, why aren't you studying Torah during your lifetime? Imo Mer Ashir Haiti VeTarud Haiti BeNechasai. If he says, look, I was very busy, I was, you know, I I had a, I had a business to take care of. Omrim Lo Klum Ashir Haita Yoter Me Rabbi Elazar. Were you were you richer than Rabbi Elazar Ben Charsum, this guy who wore the million dollar garment? 
Amru Allah al Rabbi Lazar bin Kharsum, it said about him, Shaniaklo Aviv Elef Ayarot Bayabasha, his father had left him uh, one thousand cities on dry land, a Kenegdan, and to go with them, Elef Sfinot, Alef Sfinot Bayam, a thousand ships in the sea, the whole Yom Bayom, Notel Nod Shel Kemach, Al Ktefo, every day he would pack a pound of flour uh, on his shoulder. It's like his little lunchbox. Um, he'd go from town to town, country to country, to study Torah. One time, his own servants came across him, and they didn't recognize him. They, they pressed him into service. It's like, boom, you've got to do jury duty for the guy who runs the town. You're coming with me. He told these servants, He told these servants, let me go. I need to go learn Torah. He didn't say who he was. He just said, let me go. I got to learn Torah. And then they said to him, He said, by the, they said, by the life of Rabbi Lazar bin Kharsum, we can't let you go. And then they realized, then he realized that these were his own servants. What does it show you? Uh, he, he never even made the rounds to learn who his chief servants were. All he did was learn uh, Torah all day and all night. So, no so this excuse. is a very troubling story, Alicia. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, full disclosure, when, when I told Alicia that I was swimming in COVID regulations, I didn't realize that, um, that this DAF was actually going to respond to that, my, my, you know, uh, excuse by saying, no, there's no excuse. I don't care what, what JCC you're running, you know, you've got to study Torah. But but here's a guy who didn't even know who he, who his workers were because he was absorbed in Torah study. What do you make of that? Look, you know, it's uh, I, I think that there's problems with it too. I mean, in Pirkei Avos, it says right that you have uh, that you have to have both Torah study and you have to have productive employment. Um, right. So you know, you get all different perspectives. I think the Gemara here is really just trying to drive home a point. That for anybody who wants to use the excuse that I don't have time to study Torah because this, because that, because the other thing, they're saying, hey, no excuses. At the end of your life, one of the questions you're getting asked is, you know, did you study Torah? Um, by the way, it's interesting that the first question, though, is were you honest in business? Because I yeah. guess, how do you answer that if you were never productively employed? So right. it may actually right. be that the first gate is you have to have been productively employed uh, in some way contributing to society. And then there's the studying of Torah. I think these days it would be very hard to be productive in that position if you did not know your employees. I, like I think there is a, a real challenge there. Um, but I but I also agree that um, it's not a good excuse. It's actually not a zero sum game, and you can know your employees and also um, study Torah and. Um, and I think you're right that the point here that's being made is you, can, you can't say you're too poor to study Torah. You can't say you're too rich to study Torah or too busy to study Torah. They're making a, a they're, they're very aware of the fact that if you don't build this into your life, it's not going to happen. And that I think is a very, very, I think we all experience that, right? If you don't make time for this, everything else will come first, whether it's making a living or keeping a living or distractions of any kind. And we're about to move into the big distraction. If you can make time for a trainer, you can probably make time to study a little Torah once a week, if nothing else. Um, but now the real question uh, is, what if you're too sexy to study Torah, right? That's what we're really going to grapple with now. <laughs> Rasha Omrimlo, the wicked person, they say to him, why didn't you make time to study Torah? If he says, look, I was just too good looking. And I just had so many like sexual opportunities. I mean, I really did. And then they say to him, really? Were you better looking than Yosef? You know, from Breshit. Because it said about Yosef at Sadiq, that every day they said about him that Potiphar's wife would come and she would be trying to seduce him with words and, and with deeds. The clothes that she wore in the morning, she wouldn't wear in the evening. Okay, I just love this. We've got to stop this here. We're back just to clothes. <laughs> I don't know. I, there, I, don't, I don't know whether this is just a literary device that and the smichut of the, our, our Mishnah and the, or the, the Gemara on this first um, story about the 
Cohen Gadol, but you recall, just please remember that he wore a different outfit in the morning and a different outfit in the afternoon. And he, here we are again with a change of costume for Potiphar's wife. I don't know what, to, why? <laughs> why it's, are we being told that? Because, you know, you're gonna go between different sacrifices on Yom Kippur, different attempts to seduce, you need a costume change. It's just, uh, it indicates really real effort. You're putting your thought into it, right? You're really putting your thought into it. Um, but then it goes on, of course. Begadim shalav shalo aravit, what she wore in the evening, lo lav shalo shacharit, she wouldn't wear for him in the morning. Uh, Amralo, she said to him, Hishamali, surrender yourself to me. Amarla, lo. And, she, and he said to her, no. Amralo, hareni chovashtcha, beveta asurin. She says, I'm going to put you in jail. Amarla, Hashem matir asurim. And he actually responds from something in Tehillim, from something we say in Birchot HaShachar. He says, no, nope, Hashem will free the oppressed. Hareni kofefet komatcha. She says, I'm going to break you. I'm going to bend you. Ah, he responds, Hashem zokef kifufim. Hashem straightens the bent. Also from Birchot HaShachar. She says, I'm going to blind you. Hashem pokeach ivrim. And he responds, nope, Hashem will open my eyes. He, he heals the blind. She gives him a thousand bars of silver. To listen to her, as she says. To lie with her and to be with her. But he didn't want to listen to her. So what does it mean, this phrase, he did, but he didn't do it? That means he didn't want to lie with her in this world. To be with her to be with her in hell for the rest of time. Um, so that's the story of Yosef. And the Gemara concludes, we're actually done now, I have a little more time for discussion. We'd see that Hillel obligates the poor. Rabbi Elazar ben Charsu mechayev et ashirim. Rabbi Elazar obligates the rich. Yosef mechayev et arishaim. And Yosef obligates those who are uh, undergoing sexual temptation. Um, there so is a little a, bit of a challenge here with this last story, I think. I mean, we don't have to get too distracted by it, and we'll open it up for questions. Um, but there is a parallel between rich and poor, right, Be which does not exist in this third example. And Yosef isn't wicked, right? He's the opposite of wicked. So yep. Hillel is poor and Harsom is rich, but they're like using Yosef. So I'm sort of curious if you have any um, insight on that, or it's just like they, they just needed to make this point about sexual attraction. I think, you know, Rabbi Akiva, we know, was very good looking. It's possible that these rabbis at the time, they might not have been so good looking. And maybe they're sitting here and they've got a little bit of, you know, um, a chip on their shoulder against <laughs> all the good looking folks. Like, ah, if you're good looking, you've got to be a Russia. Um, so that, that, that's possible. I do want to just take a moment and congratulate everyone who's never done a full page of Gemara before. If you've never done a full page of Gemara, well, now you have. And you can add that to your, uh, to your accomplishments. And, and hopefully you liked it and would want to do more. This was a particularly great piece because it has this nice chunky, I got it, this nice piece of story, which is so beautiful. But, but virtually everything you'll study um, will enable you to, um, to learn something, to know something different than you knew before you started. And it's, it's um, I hope that the, the, the real reason we, we want to do this, or I certainly want to do this, was that um, I think it's a great example of something that you can actually chew off, right? It's not so um, intense that you um, that you can't do it. And what what you didn't see is that the Safaria. Um, I really encourage you all to check out Safaria, which is the the new online Jewish. It's not so new online Jewish library. Will give you unbelievable access to translation to commentary. Um, you can um, you you didn't have to go to 12 years of Ramaz or five years of rabbinical school to to do this. You can anybody can. There's really a lot of access right now. Um, so let's take some questions. Rachel, are you going to manage this? Yes. Um, so I see a question in the chat. Um, please put your questions in the chat. That's easiest for us. So the first question I see is: Wasn't Yosef described as vain and taunting his brothers with his coat of many colors? Seems ah, so that, wicked to me. So that's your theory about the wickedness. Hmm, that's not, not a bad idea. Although in the story that that we've got, he is the opposite. But yes, he is described as um, 
He definitely taunts his brothers. There's no question about that. But at the time of the story, I think I think he this might be a case of he grew up quick, you know, thrown into a pit, <laughs> sold into slavery, <laughs> delivered to Potiphar like he landed on his feet and started figuring figuring things out. He does. He is one of the most extraordinary um, figures in the Hebrew Bible because he grows. He grows as a person, um, which is amazing to watch. Also, he does a he's he's the first successful parent in Breshit. You think about it, all the other brothers are fighting. Avraham's kids are fighting, right? You know, Adam's kids are fighting. You know, Yitzchak's kids, Yaakov's kids are fighting. It's only with Yosef finally that you get Ephraim and Menashe. And that's, you know, ultimately what we honor on Friday night when we bless our, our sons. Um, we ask that God make them like Ephraim and Menashe. Yosef's kind of the first one who figures out the parent game a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeff is asking a question about, um, do you think the clothing changes could be a metaphor for changing attitude or mood? I think in the case of the Kohen uh, Gadol, maybe so. Um, what happens, what's different in the afternoon, Alicia, than in the, in the morning in that, in that service? It all depends on who he is, who he's atoning for. I mean, it's interesting. He wears the white garments for a pretty bloody part of the service, which I confess, I don't fully understand either. You'd think he'd wear red. So he didn't have to do as much work on the walk. <laughs> yeah, but white is, you know, white's the color of purity. So, uh, other questions, Rachel? Yeah. I'm just following up on that. Someone asked, do the clothes show a change towards or away from Hashem? Hmm. Someone more knowledgeable than me might know. I don't know. Joy, yeah, you know. I don't know either. I don't either. I do think that this is a this point is quite interesting though that we made before, which is, do you behave differently um, when you when you wear different clothes, right? Um, uh, which is like, you know, in the in the sixties there was a big rebellion. Um, by Chavarajus um, against sort of the dressing up to go to synagogue. Um, some of that was like the kind of affluence on display that used to take place, maybe still takes place in, in synagogues where people put on, you know, elaborate clothes for Yantif. Um, and and it, it was kind of a like a badge of honor that I could go to shul in jeans and I could not get dressed up. And I have to say that I found it, I find, found it as a, as a rabbi and particularly as a woman in those early days when there were very, very few of us, um, that it mattered to me that I was different when I put on sort of the costume. It had to do, I never wore a robe, but you know, I wore a suit because I, I felt like I needed to take this more seriously even than my congregants. Did. And I think that was both gender and and just like how could I how could I make a distinction between what I was doing? You know, I was on the floor with Hebrew school kids and all kinds of other things that you do as a rabbi and services. Like there was somehow in which the weight of what it mean to meant to be the shalir tzibur, shlichat tzibur was heavier, and I had to sort of feel that on my body. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, we have a question about Alicia, how much time do you spend every day on Daf Yomi? It Good varies. Question. It varies. You know, there are some points in the Gemara where it's like very halachic, like tiny little precise issues being debated. If, if I will be honest, there are days where if it's not as interesting, I'll probably cruise through at a higher speed, mostly doing the English, not taking the time to like, you know, pick up the Aramaic as I go. Um, but then if, even if I'm busy, if there comes a day where there's like something really interesting going into the Gemara, like I'll slow down and I'll say, all right, if I don't have time for it now, I'll make time later. So it can vary from anywhere from call it 10 minutes to, uh, to 45. And That's Alicia, do you always, um, study by yourself? Do you always study in Chavruta? Do you take a class? How a, do you a lot of it, Yeah. A lot of it depends on the day about, um, call it a third of the time. My, the, my Chavrusa partner, most of the time is Rabbi, is Rabbi Shmuley Boteach. Uh, I also have my friends Matthew and sometimes my cousin Steve from Israel. So, you know, it depends on the day. So about half the time I'm doing it with a friend and half the time I'm doing it on my own. 
anytime you wake up in the morning and you go, gee, I don't know. No, it's like it gives structure to my day. I'm, I'm, I, I like structure to the day. So it's like, it's, it's, it actually gives me a little strength. It gives me a little boost. It's like a chance to, it's like mincha, you know, like mincha is like one yeah. of the best davenings because like you just get to stop for a moment think about something else that really clears your head and then go back to it. So I find that it's like mincha. You know, one thing I want to make sure we do before we um, get close to breaking our session is just say that, you know, um, Rob Joy and I discussed this over email before we started, and we felt it was appropriate to dedicate this learning to um, to Tzahal, the Israeli Defense Forces, and Sarei Abitachon, uh, all those working for Israel's security in this incredibly difficult and trying week. So this learning is for uh, is for Zecher and the Kavod, Chaylei Tzahal v'Sarei Abitachon shel Eretz Yisrael. And I actually um, uh, will just leave a, a a moment before I I see a bunch of more questions, and I'd like to take them, but I. I do want to end um, with a with a, a um, actually the words of the Kohen Gadol in the Avoda service um, that prayer for peace for for everybody who is suffering through this conflict it wasn't written about the conflict but it it um, but but you can read it in context. More questions? Yes, we have a question. Uh, two women are mentioned in this page: Rabbi Elazar Ben Harus. Harsum's mother and the wife of Potiphar. Can you comment on the infrequency of women in the Talmud and what we can learn from the mention of these two particular women on today's page? Mm. Or I can go into the tangent of the other woman that I was discussing, which will take like 30 seconds and is, is, is kind of fascinating. Rav, um, so I, I told you earlier that there's this question about what happens to Abaye and does his widow get wine? So she bears her arm, the light fills the room, and then the next thing you know, we're told that uh, one of the Ravs goes home and requests intercourse from his wife. He says, please, can I have some? And, um, and she's like, did something happen? Like, why, why are you so interested all of a sudden? Was there, was there a woman? Did you see another woman? And he says, yes, Ravi, you know, Abaye's widow was in court. And she says, I knew it. And she goes and she physically attacks the other woman and like says, you get out of this town. So it's, um, that, that's the other uh, that was the other tangent from the Abaye wine thing. So women come in in all sorts of interesting ways. One of the most fascinating ones, I think, is probably Bruria. I don't know if you would agree, Joy, in terms of like- I would, and Bruria has a name, which is not true here, right? The Bruria. widow does in the story, it's Choma, but yes, in this right. case, Bruria has a right. real name, absolutely. Right. Um, and Bruria was this, there's a tragic story. She was known to be one of the, the strongest thinkers, actually. She was issuing her own commentary, studying. She was incredibly well respected. And there's just a terrible story terrible. where one of, the rab- her children. Yeah. One, of, one of the rabbis actually, you know, is his name is then blotted out from then on in the Talmud because he's viewed to have behaved so badly. He says, you know what? She's such a wonderful woman. Let me test her. And he tests her with one of his students, uh, and they have an affair. And uh, she discovers she she's so worked she she's so distraught that it happened she kills herself actually, um, so there's there's all sorts of drama and and interesting romance. Um, I guess we have time for one more question. Rachel, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am here. Um, so what does it mean for the clothes to become pri- public property? Oh. You know that place where like all the public talisim are stored when you go to shul? Like you can bring your own or there's like, you know, the hundred, it goes there. You know, I think it, it, you know, there was a lot of commentary, a lot of discussion about how much this stuff costs, right? Um, I think it had to be of value and therefore it had to belong to the government in a sense. It couldn't just be any old clothes. It had to be, it had to be of value. Guys, this was tremendous. Joy, I can't thank you enough for uh, studying with me. I loved studying with you in prep for this. I, I love doing this with you, and uh, it, w- what a great way to start it, a tikkun. And I really, so I'm going to end with this prayer, but I, Alicia, I want to thank you because um, I, I really, um, I only did this because you asked. <laughs> As you can imagine, I was very busy. I've been very busy. And I had the same experience as the text, which is that um, you always have time to get back to your work, but you don't always have time to study. And it elevates you. It gets you out of yourself. It gets you out of your, your head. And that's really important. 
So this prayer, may it be your will, Adonai our God and God of our ancestors, to grant us with all your people, Israel, a year of abundance, a year of blessing, a year of good fortune, a year of bountiful harvest, a year of prosperity and success, a year of assembly in your holy place. These words take on new meaning in, in our post-pandemic era, right? A year of song, a year of fulfilling life, a year of dew and rain and sun, a year of sweet fruit at the harvest, a year of rest, a year of consolation, a year of abundant joy, a year of delight, a year of peace, and a year of tranquility. May it be so. Uh, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, Chag Sameach, everybody. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Chag Sameach.